Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Riggs Library here at Georgetown. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you for this special conversation with Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, the 52nd Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, and Reverend Jim Wallace, the Director of our Center on Faith and Justice, Chair in Faith and Justice at our McCourt School of Public Policy. Madam Speaker, we're deeply honored to have you with us this morning. I want to thank you for your presence with us and for the many ways over the years that you've engaged and supported our Georgetown community. It is always a pleasure to have you back on the hilltop. And Jim, we could not be more grateful to you and the team at the Center on Faith and Justice for convening this conversation and the work you are doing to engage our Georgetown community and our broader Washington, D.C. community on issues of social justice, faith, and public service. This morning's gathering inaugurates a new series for the Center entitled Higher Calling, and this series will engage political leaders and public servants in conversations about the role of religion and ethics in, in their public and in their private lives. The Center on Faith and Justice was first launched in November 2021 under the direction of Reverend Wallace, founder of Sojourners, and since then has promoted engagement with issues from voting rights and gun control to child poverty and the war in Ukraine. As part of their work, they have convened gatherings with religious leaders and members of Congress, helped to lead a campaign across 10 states to protect voting rights during the 2022 elections, and launched a summer program to bring seminarians to our nation's capital to engage lawmakers and one another in conversations about advancing the common good. Jim, over these past 16 months since your launch event on race, religion, and voting rights with uh, Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock and Representative Terry Sewell, you have demonstrated the extraordinary capacities of an academic center focused on faith and justice here at Georgetown and in our McCourt School of Public Policy and the impact we can have on issues that are at the heart of a multicultural and multiracial democracy. As we launch this new series, Higher Calling, we could not be more privileged to have the Honorable Nancy Pelosi with us to share her wisdom and offer her perspectives as someone deeply committed to our nation and to faith. For more than 35 years, she has served in the U.S. House of Representatives. Twice she was elected speaker. Her longevity and her impact in these roles are testament to her leadership, to her vision for our nation, and to her commitment to public service. Some years ago, in 2002, she was describing what this commitment to public service meant to her in an address to our graduates of our School of Foreign Service. And she was recounting, recounting her experiences during college. She attended Trinity College here in Washington and came over to Georgetown for a course with one of the giants on our faculty, Professor Carol Quigley. Professor Quigley taught history. His course, Development of Civilizations, was one of the School of Foreign Service's most popular courses for three decades. And Speaker Pelosi shared a lesson that she had learned from Professor Quigley, which I think has a resonance with our conversation this morning. She said this, and I quote, when I took that class at Georgetown so long ago, Professor Quigley taught us something I will never forget. He said that America is the greatest country in the history of the world because our people have always believed in two things, that tomorrow can be better than today and that every one of us has a personal moral responsibility to make it so, close quote. So this series, this center, seeks to explore precisely the personal moral responsibility that each of us have to advance our country and our democracy. I look forward to the conversation that Jim and Speaker Pelosi will have, to the insights they will share with us as two leaders who have lived out this responsibility in such extraordinary ways. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Jack, as always. Uh, and welcome, uh, Madam Speaker Emerita, all these wonderful titles. Uh, and uh, Nancy Pelosi has been a friend to many of us over the years. And I'm just thrilled that you, I can't imagine a better person to begin this series of higher calling. How does the faith of political leaders, elected <laughs> officials, how does that shape their politics? That's a big question we will look at today. 
through her eyes. So we had students lining up at 7.30 this morning <laughs> out here. I love this place, Riggs. It's a wonderful place in Georgetown. Uh, so let's just begin. I'll say I believe in the separation of church and state, but not the segregation of moral values mm -hmm. from public life. And that's what we're doing here today. So you were raised uh, not far from here in Baltimore, mm -hmm. and your dad was the mayor. You're raised in a Catholic home and family. And you said that your parents did not raise you to become the Speaker of the House, the most powerful woman ever in American politics, but as you say, to be holy, to be good, to be holy, to be good. I like that. How do they do that? And, and, and tell us what, what you learned about Catholic faith growing up in that home. So how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> You're going way back. Oh, thank you, Jim, for your question. Thank you, Mr. President, for your kind words and for your great leadership of this magnificent institution. All of you have to know that being in Riggs Library is a special privilege. Uh, I've had the honor of being here when my husband was chairman of the board of the Foreign Service School, now emeritus, and uh, we hear from about our values and our national uh, our, our role in the world. It was always a special occasion to be in the Riggs Library. Thank you for that opportunity today, and hopefully we'll live up to the uh, expectation of faith, the Gospel of Matthew, and, uh, and congratulations to you. You are, he's so remarkable, has been an intellectual, spiritual resource to so many of us in the public arena for a very long time. So I have some questions for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. About Cronus and all, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, I was raised in a Catholic family, and I, when I said what I said about what, why my, how my parents raised us, when I was nominated to be speaker the first time, I went up to the podium, and the uh, Rahm Emanuel, now the ambassador to Japan, but then the chair of our caucus said, hugged me and said, your parents would be so proud. And it really took me aback, and I thought, they didn't raise me to be speaker. I don't even <laughs> know about this. They raised me to be holy, and that's how that came to be. But it, uh, again, we, he was born in Baltimore, Maryland, Little Italy in Baltimore. Um, devoutly Catholic, proud of our Italian-American heritage, fiercely patriotic, and in our case, staunchly democratic. <laughs> we saw a connection between our public responsibility and our faith, agreeing with you, Reverend Wallace, that it is a separation of power, but not a separation of responsibility. And so um, it was always about helping other people that we had that responsibility as a matter of our faith. Mm -hmm. Some of us would do that in a political role. I never intended to do so. But we are always, 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 um, I don't say told, just by example, knowing that you had to treat people with great respect, with great respect. We're all God's children, and whatever our differences are, we have to be treated with respect and that there's that spark of divinity in every person. John Lewis talked about that all the time. He talked mm -hmm. about Sewell and Warnick, and that's who they are as well. A spark of divinity in every person. We truly believed, now some of this is, comes later, but we truly believed then that um, when Christ came down from heaven, his participation in our humanity enabled us to participate in his divinity. Hence that spark of divinity. So we must treat everyone, whether it's a, a, an immigrant at the border or a homeless person on the street or the president of the university, but also to recognize we had that spark and that had responsibilities that went with it. Now later, only in recent years, I was told about a Jewish, do you, is there a Jewish theologian? Is that a proper? Mm -hmm. Thinker, I mean, yeah. who uh, said that because of that spark of divinity, every one of us, when we come forward, when you leave here, there are like 10,000 angels escorting you <laughs> because you have that spark of divinity. Well, I don't know, we have to make room for that. And sometimes it's hard to see it with some people, but nonetheless, 
that's what we believe. So that spark of divinity uh, also is in scripture is all us being created in the image of God, that's which right. uh, of God. Reverend Warnock talks about as well. Yeah. I learned your mother wanted you to be a nun, yeah. uh, but you're more interested in being a priest. <laughs> But either way, you got a Catholic education. Yeah. And how did your experience in that Catholic education help shape your moral education? And how did it teach you to be a leader who, as some say, would stand up and speak out? Well, uh, let me just say, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Catholic education, I was just writing um, an op-ed for the Catholic Reporter about Pope Francis and his 10-year anniversary as Pope, and I had the privilege of being there. It was the Feast of St. Joseph just a couple of days ago. They were recording when he was elected. I was talking about when he was had the installation a few, few days apart. He chose the Feast of St. Joseph, which is a beautiful thing. St. Joseph, a protector, and that's what I see him as. But the... Um, and so in the article I write, because I had to bring it up to date, and Annalisa knows it, Annalisa knows it. over 150 years of Catholic education, not in my family I grew up in. Yes, it would even be much, much more, five older brothers. But in Paul, my husband, who went to Georgetown, our five children, our um, uh, grandchildren, I'm not even counting my sons-in-law. I mean, I'm just calling about our immediately, our immediate uh, family. Over 150, and the number continues to mm -hmm. grow. And that's their choice. That is, they have chosen where they want to go to school. And I think they saw uh, the value of that, um, that when they have so many choices, but that's what they chose. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, um, and we're excited about that because of the values that are there but also because the Catholic education is Catholic with a capital C and a, cap a small c, universal and, and um, beautiful in that respect. The, um, you know, the Gospel of Matthew is just such a guide, you know. Did you want to say something about Well, that? in fact, I would, we'd be in meetings, political meetings about <laughs> issues, and she would bring up this text in Matthew, in the middle of a political meeting, she'd say, well, Matthew 25 <laughs> reminds us that how we treat the least of these is how we treat Christ himself. So here's this, the Speaker of the House raising the Matthew text in the middle of political meetings up on the hill. Why is that text so important to you, and why do you keep raising it, particularly over there on the hill? Well, remember, Christ the Lord did not just say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was homeless, you sheltered me. When I was in prison, you visited me. I love that one because it broadens our responsibility. He also said, when I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was homeless, you did not shelter me. So I think that other part of it is really important. It is. Too. Christ, when did I ignore you? Well, both sides of, of that coin. Mm -hmm very important, and many people are uh, ostensibly, and I respect that they are people of faith, but when it comes to the execution of it from the standpoint of our responsibilities, we have to sometimes remind, uh, remind people. And as you know well, the least of these are often the least important on Capitol Hill. You know, I've always had a problem with that phrase? Least. Yeah. Because I don't consider them least. Right. They mm -hmm. have a spark of divinity. They're all God's children. Mm -hmm. And I keep thinking there must be something about the translation that is calling <laughs> them least. It, that's, that's my thing about that. Just share that with you. But should we call them the... Well, it's really about... Most needy or something like that. It's really the most poor and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's... That text, I call that the it was me text. I was hungry, it was me, I was thirsty, it okay, was me. Like that. Okay. So it's the it was me text, and it's really the poorest, most vulnerable. And the scriptures say that, that legislators and kings and rulers and princes will be judged not on their gross national product or their military firepower or their cultural dominance, but how they 
treat the poorest and most vulnerable. And you mm-hmm. raise that again That's and again. Ages. In terms of my being a nun, um, <laughs> 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 and they said I want to be a priest. Imagine the priest every day. They have the power of the, the miracle mystery. I don't know if it's mm-hmm. called a mystery, mm-hmm. but of transubstantiation, of turning wine, bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That is real power. Now we're talking power. And that's why I was more attracted to that than being a nun. On the other hand, maybe one day women will be able to do that as, as well. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's something that I'm thinking about. I was hoping the Pope would too, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Something we should think about a lot more. <laughs> Now, I love, um, I love uh, how you, you describe um, your job, uh, that you don a suit of armor. Oh, yeah. I'm reading this now. Put on your brass knuckles, eat nails for breakfast, go out there and stop them from taking food out of the mouths of babies. So when during babies the babies out of the arms of their mothers, you know, it goes right. on. <laughs> so when during the day do you feed that um, <laughs> that spiritual life, and do you pray the rosary before or after you put on your brass knuckles? <laughs> I actually uh, mostly at night, but during the night, if I awaken, I, I feel the call to to pray, uh, and. Um, um, mostly at night, but in the morning too. I, I believe in prayer. I really do. And again, after time goes by, you'll find that, uh, well, faith, prayer, faith. Faith is such a gift. Not everybody has it. We have to recognize that. Because when some people say to me, well, how come you believe this? Oh, it's a gift of faith. You don't have it. I do. Okay. But the... Um, it's such a gift, and you talk about uh, Terry Sewell and, and um, uh, Senator Warnock, and I talked about John Lewis. I do believe that faith is what got people through the civil rights, mm-hmm. uh, the, the ch- leading up to it, and of course in that fight. Faith is um, a gift, again, a gift of God, and it, is, it gives people hope. And when people ask me, where is hope? Uh, why should we be hopeful? I say, hope is where it has always been sitting comfortably between faith and charity. People have faith in the goodness of others. That gives them hope. So faith, though, is key to to all of it. Mm -hmm. And so prayer, of course, and we've been praying a lot, of course, for my husband uh, lately. He's been, and thank you, Georgetown, for having the prayer service for him. But he's been the beneficiary of so many prayers. And I, and I like to see that people are motivated to, to pray. You raised your husband, Paul, you met here, and we've all been, as you know, praying for him. But this was a senseless attack yeah. on your husband and your family. And, uh, but it's part of a wave of violence, a wave mm-hmm. of violence and threats against political leaders at every level. So there probably are students here today considering public service as a vocation for them, as it has been for you. But maybe they're put off by that that terrible polarization and even the violent threats. So what would you have to say to students here who are discerning their (coughs) vocation of public service and maybe are a little 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 concerned or frightened even by the by the hate and the violence? Well even before this shall we say last six years ago, the horrible thing that happened to our country at that time, which I won't go into politics here, but the, I, when I came to Congress so over 35 years ago, as Mr. President said, there were like 23 women in Congress, 12 Democrats and 11 Republicans, 435 people. Even if there were just 23 in this room out of this bigger crowd, that would be not the right number. Okay. So I made a decision right then and there, forget about this. We've got to make a change. We now have about 95, 96 Democrats. They have maybe 30 or something Republicans. They're making progress, and that's good. But um, when I would go to women and say, you should run, and I'm saying it to you here, you should run 
Nothing is more wholesome in the political process and government or anything, edu academic world, corporate America, the uh, um, military, our security and anything, than the fuller participation of women in leadership and just their participation. And I would expand that to say diversity writ large, not just women, but uh, younger people, people of color, all the rest of that. So when I would go to these women, they'd say, I could never subject my family mm. to what you go through. I'm not talking about somebody coming to my house and saying, where's Nancy, and making a deadly assault on my husband. That, that is in a different category. I'm just talking about negative ads on TV that don't, what they do with mm. women is they will, mm. they will go, to, they know that women have, forgive me gentlemen, a strong reputation for integrity. So they attack you right on integrity. They'll say, she said this or this or that. It won't even be true, but that's what they'll say. And then the other thing they'll say is, it's about children. She wants to spend a fortune. And by the way, these children are all immigrants. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that disgusting? But that's mm -hmm. how they, and I can show you stacks of mailers and ads that they do, attack the integrity and the compassion that women have. But, doesn't mean that you are not sensitive to fiscal responsibility, but that's how they would frame it. And so people said, I walk down the street and my neighbor, whom I know, crosses the street not to encounter me. My children come home from school crying because somebody repeated an ad they saw on TV. That's, that's not part of a democracy. Mm -hmm. So again, if we could lower the... Uh, role of money, increase the level of civility, we would have many more women and the rest there. Now, I'm very proud of the number that we have. It takes courage. So if you're thinking about this, think hard, because again, nothing is more wholesome than that. And each one of you, I talked about this spark of divinity, but every one of you, and I say this to the young men who are in here too, the students and teachers, whatever, um, in the history of the world, there has never been anybody like you. You are the authentic, sincere you. And that is incredibly valuable. Because it, it isn't a question of women are better than men, so we should have them at the table. The diversity at the table is the strength. I say to the members, our diversity is our strength. Our unity is our power. The unity has to come from discussion, springing from that inclusiveness and diversity. And our president is very much committed to this. So I would say to the women, um, don't let them, don't let them, whoever they are, um, be daunting to you. You have something very valuable to contribute that is very necessary. And we always say, when women succeed, America succeeds. But you can apply that uh, to any country, any culture, any society in the world. So I'm always encouraging women, but it's not for the faint of heart. Since you talked about the nails for breakfast, I'll go to another place. Um, President um, Teddy Roosevelt, Republican. I'm quoting a Republican. He said. <laughs> He's, he talked about the arena. You know his speech about the arena. If you don't, you should read that. It's a most amazing statement. But he talks about you're not a spectator. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the arena. So I say to these members, when you think you're going to run for office, know your why. Why are you doing this? Because that justifies all the pain mm -hmm. that goes with it. And I say pain. Um, isn't pain to me because I consider the source, but you know, the pain that goes with. So when you're in that arena, you have to be prepared to take a punch. And you have to be prepared to throw a punch for the children. <laughs> <laughs> Always for the children. My why, if one in five children in America lives in poverty, goes to sleep hungry at night, what? In the greatest country that ever existed in the history of the world? So that's what took me from the kitchen to the Congress, from housewife to house speaker. <laughs> it's, a, it's a powerful thing when you say uh, we need more and new people at the table yeah. rather than just influencing the table, like we always want to change policy. 
but who's at the table is so important. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. Is your generation, all mm -hmm. of you, in mm -hmm. the wholeness and fullness of who you are going to be at the table where decisions are being made for policy? And we want you at the head of the table. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right, Jack. Moral, moral education. You talked about Catholic education, moral education. So, so sometimes, uh, many people of faith, many of us, and politicians, sometimes disagree, don't always agree with the leaders of our church on every matter of public policy. But when those complex issues are raised, you often cite conscience. Conscience. Yeah. The conscience is what uh, determines who and what you will support yeah. and in these complex moral issues. So what goes into the formation of Nancy Pelosi's conscience? Well, I, uh, my parents had a big impact on us, especially my mother, uh, in terms of we have a free will. God has given us a free will, and we have a moral responsibility to live up to that response, uh, uh, that free will and what it gives us. So, I mean, I was raised in a family that you would describe probably as pro-life, although I think I'm pro-life because I care about children and the rest. But nonetheless, that was kind of their thing. I mean, they weren't rallying in the streets, but that's who they were, are. And, um, but I would say, Mom, you said this is a matter of free will, and people have a responsibility to live up to their responsibilities. So that's the path I'm on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have a problem with my archbishop, well, the archbishop of the city that I represent. And, um, but I mean, I figure that's his problem, not mine, because I, I have five children, six years and one week. Uh, Three of them went to Georgetown. Uh, the, the, um, so I keep saying to the, my members, you got five kids in six years? You want to talk about this subject, OK? Uh, I, I, I go right to the one issue, because everything else, we're pretty much in sync when it talks about the social uh, compact of the Catholic bishops and the rest. But they are willing to abandon the bulk of it because of one thing. And that's the fight that we have. Mm -hmm. Today is the 13th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. It's something I'm very, very, very proud of. <laughs> but all I can say about how we passed that is thank God for the nuns. Thank God <laughs> for the nuns. That's because true. they offset the bishops. The bishops were just mischaracterizing what was in there. They know I say this all the time. So. Um, mischaracterizing what was in there, make, and their purpose was to destroy Roe v. Wade right in that bill. Of course, we were not going to let that happen, but thank God for the nuns, because some of our members wrote the Hyde Amendment. They wrote the Hyde Amendment. You know, the Hyde Amendment says that there can't be any funds uh, for terminating a, a, a pregnancy unless it's the life of the mother, you know, rape, incest, life of the mother. That was written by our staunch pro-life members. God bless them. Some had been in the seminary. They, some were not Catholic, but, and I respect their view for them, for them and their family, but I didn't think that that should be dictated to the rest of the world. But in any event, those members voted for the bill because they said, we wrote, we wrote this. It's not in this, it's not contradicted in this legislation. But the bishops were trying to sell the point. Oh, you got me started on the bishop. Uh, the, the bishops were trying to make the point that, that um, it was, and in taking down it, they would take down the bill, forgetting the co social compact. And when I was sick, you tend to my knees. And uh, so, again, because we, had the nuns, then it was able, we were able to prevail. So when that happened, just because it's the day, President Senator Kennedy was very much a part of all of this, and then he died. And then his seat was 
not won by the Democrats or anybody who would be supportive of the Affordable Care Act, having nothing to do with women's right to choose, but having to do with the insurance companies and people, anti-governance people, anti-science people, you know. So the press said to me, how, um, I consider this an article of faith ministering to the needs of the sick, so mm -hmm. if, if you consider this a di digression, I've, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. The, uh, say, the press said, oh, it's over for you because you have lost the seat in Massachusetts. I said, well, we are, we are not walking away from this. This is a challenge, a hundred years, presidents have tried to expand access to quality, affordable health care. President Roosevelt tried to do it. Even Republic, our good friend Teddy Roosevelt, and the rest of that. In any event, the, um, they said, well, how are you going to do this? I said, well, this is getting back to the nuns. Well, um, we're not going to let anything stand in our way. We're going to make this done. This is our generational responsibility. So if there's a, a fence that is blocking our way, we'll push open the gate. If that doesn't work, we'll climb the fence. If that doesn't work, we'll pole vault in. If that doesn't work, we'll parachute in. But we are not letting anything stand in the way of our passing this. People are saying shrink it and blah, blah, blah. So after we passed it, when they were saying, this is impossible, after we passed it, they said, which one did you do? I said, we just pushed open the gate. Because not only were our members courageous in voting for this, but we had the outside. And remember this, our inside maneuvering can only go so far in the political system. The outside mobilization, mm -hmm. the message to the public is what is so important. So when we pushed open that gate, the nuns were right there with us, pushing open the gate. In fact, you should, students, take a look at the Affordable Care Act and how Catholic women religious were central, central. key factor in passing because they thought the Affordable Care Act was pro-life. That's right. Look at, it is. Look at, in Catholic social te teaching, what the consistent ethic of life is in that, which is not just focus on one issue, but that's the broader... Catholic teaching that I would encourage you to take a look at. So I remember we had, as President DeJoy said, we have seminarians come every summer from all over the country, and you came to, to speak to our seminarians. In fact, you wanted to be the first speaker to speak to them. Here's these seminarians, and here's Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, and she starts talking to them about the incarnation. <laughs> the incarnation. I didn't expect that. Incarnation. That was an amazing cover. You went through the incarnation and how it shapes your politics. And then some of them asked this. This is my question to you here. Um, they said, why don't Democrats speak more and talk more about their faith? They said, when Republicans do all the time, it makes people think that Republicans are the Christians and Democrats are reluctant. Chris Coons was there and Raphael Warnock. And they asked, my seminarians asked, why can't Democrats feel more, more free, more, more willing, uh, not to proselytize, but to speak yeah. about how their faith shapes their politics? So how do you answer that question? How can we get Democrats to do more of what you did that day? Well, I think us? that, I mean, I see them <clears throat> regularly, in fact, this morning in caucus. The, um, How can I say this without causing a stir? I always like to say, if we're going to pray in church on Sunday, or whatever day of the week, mm -hmm. let us avoid praying on people with an E the rest of the week, which some of these, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Yes, those people. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's what they do. They, they talk about their faith and this or that. But then when we talk about feeding and sheltering and clothing and respecting and the rest of that, Matthew boom, 25. forget about that. <laughs> so, it, it, but yeah, I, I do think that people do in their own districts and their own conversations. Um, I think there's a re reluctance to say use polit politics as a, I mean, I talk about it because that's, who I am, you know, yeah. I, but, and, and that's who they are too. 
we have one or two who are maybe three that are humanist. So they, and they do some of the best work for the poor, mm -hmm. uh, but they pronounce that you know, we shouldn't have a prayer at the beginning of session and all the rest of that. But it, no, I, I, I guess it's a good message. Talk more about your faith. Talk more about the flag. You know, but again, it's, it's, um, that's who we are, and we should be more sincerely convincing to the public uh, that we share those, yeah. we share those values. Yeah. I have a question for you. So, center on faith and justice. This is the word faith, as we talked about earlier. Justice, justice. Pope Paul the sixth. If you want peace, work for justice. This is the important word because this is the word of respect for people whether we're talking about social justice, environmental justice, uh, justice in the courts, justice in the world, justice. And I just left, um, after our caucus, I visited with a woman, Svetlana. Svetlana is the presidential candidate in, in um, Belarus. Her husband is imprisoned. He was the candidate. She then became the candidate. He's still imprisoned. She's uh, in Lithuania, and we had this... Um, session this morning about someone named Kalinowski, who 160 years ago, at age 25, was speaking out for justice and peace and democracy in Belarus. They killed him at 26, but his message was always to work for peace and justice and democracy, and that's what she's doing. A young woman, mm -hmm. a heroine, really. But the justice word is something that means a great deal to President Biden in his Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Justice in terms of how we meet the needs of people, justice in listening to how they want their needs. When it's having them at the table, whether we're talking about infrastructure or chips or whatever it happens to be, where is the justice in the legislation that enables everyone to participate? So congratulations to Georgetown and to you for your being the head of the Center for Faith and Justice. That's Wonderful. Could you talk to them about what you t used to teach us about Kronos, the time, the time? Kairos and Kronos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, faith and justice are inseparable, and the word righteousness in the Bible, when you see that, it means justice. So it's just inseparable. Uh, Kairos time is, uh, Kronos time is just tick-tock, tick-tock, normal time, day by day, keeping our schedules. Kairos time is moments uh, when, when the change, time, and even history, particular moments, Kairos, that really are going to change us. And I think we're in one of those I times so. right now where uh, democracy, as you and I both believe, are, is literally at stake, uh, and where the integrity of faith is at stake. Because of those people who do this, who privatize faith. To privatize faith is a heresy. That's the American, that's the white Christian heresy, privatize faith. Uh, but taking faith public is what you've done your whole, whole life. Mm -hmm. So we're at a moment when democracy is being tested like no other time in my lifetime. And we've been, we've been around for a while, the two of us. And, and the integrity of faith. And the third thing that's at stake is you, this new generation. Because if the church is if faith doesn't come down on the side of multiracial democracy, then a lot of young people will never darken the door of a church. They won't go anymore. If we don't come down on the right side of history in terms of making sure there's a path to fulfill, fulfilling the promise of our democracy, a new generation won't want to come anymore. So to me, that's a stake, democracy and faith and a new generation. So once again, say what the word is of the moment not, not the day by day, but the moment you see us in. Yeah, there, was, uh, there were times in history in South Africa where many of us were involved where it's like the moment at stake here. But that word? Kairos. 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 The word is kairos. It means the fullness, the fullness, the implication, the meaning of this moment will change more than our clocks. Yeah. It'll change more. It'll change life and existence and 
our perspective and where we're going. And so, as the president says, what's at stake is the soul of the nation. That's literally at stake now in this country. And this, this uh, Catholic, this political leader, this woman has, has changed That's politics good. in this co country. I want to give them a chance to ask okay, you I would do, but j just more Demi questions. Des okay. He mentioned South Africa, and your your yeah. center is uh, related to Desmond Tutu. Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu. Right. Oh, he's so wonderful. Yeah. He was so wonderful. Um, you know, I don't want you to think that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I work very close with them on human rights mm -hmm. around the world, yeah. have forever in Congress, and especially religious freedom yeah. around the world. Yeah. So th th that is a strong commitment and bonding, a, a unifying thing for us. So we have questions from the, the audience? Yeah, and Bishop Tutu taught me the difference in hope, you mentioned hope, and optimism. Optimism is a feeling, how are things going today? Hope is a decision, a choice we make because of our faith. I see some now, where there's microphones going to run around to you, so raise your hands, stand where you are, and here's our first question. If you could tell us who you are and what you're studying, that'd be great. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. My name is Andrew. I'm a graduate student here in the McCourt School of Public Policy. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells us to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to render unto God what is God's. Um, and I'm curious to hear from your great experience, is there a fundamental conflict in public service between rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's and rendering unto God what is God, especially as a Catholic, because you took an oath dozens of times to the Constitution as a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's a secular, human-made institution. Yes. And yet, every Sunday, you take an oath to an eternal institution. Mm -hmm. Do those two come into conflict, either specifically or even generally? Are they on a collision course sometimes? And what implications does that have for both being devout Catholics and trying to be constitutional Democrats with a little d? I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, um, I, I was trying to remember that, oh, this whole poem about the apostles. But when it comes to Matthew, it says, Matthew, can, Matthew the publican man of the town. So Matthew knew what he was talking about when he talked about that because he was, he was um, not necessarily a fisherman, which was a wonderful thing to be, but he was a, a public. He understood the public side of things as well, and I think that it's a very incons consistent for us to take the oath and also be true. And one of the great inspiring lines for many of us in Congress, certainly on one side of the aisle, I mean, it's probably on the other side too, is the, the speech that uh, the inauguration of John F. Kennedy, which I attended as a student. You weren't born yet, neither of your parents probably. <laughs> but it was history to you, my youth. Um, at the end, Kennedy said, God's work must truly be our own. And that's, mm -hmm. we're big enough to accommodate God's work in our public arena without having um, a state religion or anything like that as, mm -hmm. as a, do I call you, what do I call you now, a director? Jim. Jim. Oh, still Jim, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it's a, a wonderful question because it's the existential question of who are we and what are we there to do and what is our, our shall we say, priority in all of this. And our priority is to honor the Constitution consistent with our values, but not dictating a, shall we say, state religion in order to do that, or making judgments about other people in how they honor their oath of office. The problem is those who do not honor their oath of office, and that's part of the fight we're having in this Kairos moment now. This is where conscience and Catholic social teaching come into play in that framework, uh, how you act in the moment. So other questions? Right here. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi, for your amazing sharing. Uh, first of all, as a Chinese, oh, sorry, I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Zhi Chang, a grad student. Uh, studying uh, data science for public policy at the McCourt School. Um, as a, also as a Chinese national, I want to thank you 
for your long-standing and unwavering support for Chinese uh, democracy movement since the Tiananmen Square to the present day. And um, my question is about your recent visit to Taiwan. And your visit to Taiwan last year did not only uh, anger China, but also did not receive support from the White House. So I think that decision and that visit showed great, um, great courage and, demonstration and determination. So my question is that, did your uh, special faith play a role in this decision? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your question, uh, and I appreciate your comment about the visit to Taiwan. The, the White House had to do what they had to do, right? But, and I had to do what I had to do. Uh, I've had been opposing White House on China for 35 years, Democrats and Republicans. <clears throat> I wasn't really opposing the president. We were just going to China, the, the, uh, to Taiwan. The thing is, is that it did not represent a change in U.S. policy. We have one China policy. But it was not going to let the president of China isolate Taiwan, a democracy uh, that is uh, thriving and, and, and the rest, uh, because what? Because the president of China said that? I mean, I unfurled a banner in Tiananmen Square in 1991. I've been fighting the Chinese for, for um, decades on human rights, whether it's Tibet, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's uh, um, the Uyghurs, whether it's Hong Kong, you name it. Uh, and, and again, my problem with the Chinese has been the proliferation of weapon technologies of mass destruction to rogue countries, as well as the lack of market asset access for our products into China, unless we give them the designs and then they don't need our product, and also their violations of our intellectual property. The list goes on. However, having said that, I say to my colleagues in the Congress, I take second place to none of you in my criticism of China, but we do have to work together, find some areas of common ground to protect God's creation. Laudate mm -hmm. Si, the Pope's encyclical, mm -hmm. on, on protecting the, uh, God's creation, as well as I consider the people of China God's creation, too, and we want to protect them. But, it, but um, no, I wouldn't say that the administration was they had to do what they had to do, to say what they had to say. Uh, the president of Ch Taiwan is coming to the United States shortly, in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, our, the current speaker is not going to go to Taiwan, he said, but he's going to welcome her at the Reagan Library. I'll welcome her in New York, and I'm sure that will make President Xi even less a happy person than he is right now. <laughs> but it is... Um, May I just tell you a story? This may take too long. So I've been on this case for a long time. Even before Tiananmen Square, I, I visited with His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he came to the Congress before. I was a brand new member of Congress, and I was meeting the Dalai Lama. I couldn't even believe it. And he was the first person to receive a Nobel Prize with the mention of the environment in it. Right. You know, with all the other aspects of the Dalai Lama, His Holiness. So. Over the years, oh my gosh, what they've done to Tibet is horrible, and the way they treat people, uh, terrible, awful. awful. And um, so one time I brought a delegation to India to visit His Holiness at Dharamsala, where he is. And while we were there, I'd been there a number of times, so my colleagues were taking a tour of the place, you know, the, the, I don't know if you would call it, I, I use Catholic words on their chapel, but whatever it is, the prayer center. Whatever. And it, it, it's, it's remarkable to go to see the children. They're so fabulous. But anyway, all these people were coming from Taiwan over the, excuse me, Tibet, over the border. And they're kissing the hem. Of, he said, you come sit with me while I listen to these people coming over the border. So the others are out there. Oh, they're kissing his hand. Oh, your holiness, this is, this is, they're doing this, and they're doing that, and this to the, uh, the children, this, and all these horrible things that are happening in Tibet because of the Chinese. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to uh, make it a Han place. They're destroying the culture, the religion, the language, the whole thing. And they go on and on. Oh, they're crying, and it's awful. It was horrible. Oh, my God, everything that I ever feared, here it is, the personification right there with his holiness. So after we 
do our thing, our big rally in the streets with American flags and Indian flags and Tibetan flags and all that. Visit the children in the schools. We go to lunch with the lamas. They have all these young lamas from uh, in North India, that, that part of India. Is Matt here? There, Matt. And we thank the government of India for their hospitality to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for all of these years. So anyway, His Holiness speaks to the lamas, and then I get up and say, we have this delegation, Democrats and Republicans, we're going to get the visas, we're going to get the appropriations, we're going to get the this, we're going to get the that, or this or that, because if we refuse to speak up for human rights in China because of, vi of commercial interest, it's all about money, right? because of commercial interest, we lose all moral authority to talk about human rights any place in the world. So I go sit down, His Holiness gets up, he says to the lamas, now, you understand what the morning was like, what the history was like all those decades. He gets up and he says to them, to the lamas, let us pray for Nancy so we rid her of her negative attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Dalai Lama? Yeah. He's such so, a beautiful person. And, then, and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, but we, so we must find paths where we can come together on all of this. But uh, the courage of the young people and the uh, dissidents in China and the church, of course, I've had my little disagreement with the Pope on the church in, in China, too. You know, they, I, I think they learned that, that there was no... What they did was they gave them a little bit of a say in who the bishops are. And I said, wait a minute. Then we're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my <laughs> church. And now it's the President Xi having veto power over who the bishops are. In China, well, we wanted to reach out and bring people together. These Catholics in China have been martyrs, martyrs. That, you know, I, I, I will take too long to go into a whole thing about how they <laughs> killed them. And they're martyrs, and then they wanted to or to join the underground Catholics who have been martyrs with the official Catholic Church or something. But I don't think they've gained anything from it. If you just, just incidentally. So here's a good example of this conversation. You asked a political question. What's the White House think? What's the speaker going to do? And of course, nobody can predict or control what the speaker does. Uh, but your answer quotes a Catholic encyclical on the environment, which she's read. Right? Talks about her last contract with the Dalai Lama and how the Dalai Lama was praying last, for her but attitude. Recent. Yeah. So that, that's, that's putting faith in the politics. Okay, mm -hmm. that's an example you just heard of how, how it's done. So, another question. Yes, right A here. woman. How can I, yes, with right all here. due respect, there gentlemen. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Deepa Fuyal. I'm a freshman um, undergraduate in the School of Foreign Service. Wonderful. Um, and earlier you mentioned the point of contention with the bishops on the issue of abortion. Do yeah. you experience those same divides on issues of LGBTQ plus rights, um, such as gay people trying to get married in a Catholic church? And how do you reconcile those divides? Do you try to convince the bishops otherwise? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, in our particular case, we are at the extreme. We have people say to me, it's so easy for you to be for all these LGBTQ rights. They've been saying this to me for uh, my first words on the floor of the house were about HIV and AIDS. The very, very first words were about HIV and AIDS. So, and people said to me, why did you talk about that? Is that the first thing you want anybody to know about you? Why did you say you came here to fight HIV and AIDS? I said, because I did. Because I did. And so we've had, how can I say this nicely? There's just no way. We've had very, very negative anti-LGBTQ stuff coming from our archbishop and others. And he was responsible for putting on the ballot Proposition 8 because he had all this conservative money that put this ballot on the ballot, something about marriage. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but we got rid of it later. So he's been every parade against women's honoring their own sense of responsibility, or LGBTQ, he's, he leads. And so he's made it very clear. 
maybe we're not all God's children. Maybe we do not have a free will, that old friend, a free will to do what we honor our responsibilities. But the LGBTQ thing gives me hope for this because what all the outside group, remember I said the outside group, what they did, LGBTQ on HIV and AIDS, really took us to a place where people said that was fast to get respect for marriage. No, it wasn't fast. It's all part of the same thing. And it's people knowing people. I didn't know my son or daughter was LGBT until I found that he or she had HIV AIDS. But anyway, knowing people has changed that attitude a lot. Right now, our challenge are trans kids, that in certain states, they will arrest you if you try to meet the needs of your trans child, the health needs of, they will call that child abuse. So yeah, and some of it is stirred up by some of the uh, more conservative leaders in the church. Uh, it's sad to say, not its holiness or that, but the um, right now we have a problem because we just had a meeting and. Uh, uh, in Baltimore, where I'm from, and one of the workshops we had was LGBTQ. 300 bills across the country as of a couple weeks ago, maybe more now, to attack trans families. 300 bills. And many of them saying that one person told the story of a, a woman from Texas, Trumpite all the way, and her six-year-old child said, Mommy, I'm a girl. I think I'm a girl. They did conversion and all that, you know. So of course, it doesn't work, but nonetheless, they did all that stuff. And then she wanted to meet the health needs of her child in terms of psychologically, physically, what that means down the road and all the rest of that. And the laws in Texas are about that would be child abuse. So she and the physicians and the rest would be breaking the law because they're meeting the needs of a child. So this, is, this is, takes it to a different place. Whether it's health care, whether it's education, or their personal favorite, sports, this is an assault on that. So one of the answers is right back where I started. People just have to know families that have confronted this and the loving attitude many of them have for their children. I've been meeting these families for a long time now, but I also see kids on the streets of San Francisco who mm -hmm. are there because right. their families disowned them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're young, they're trans, or they may just be LGBTQ, but they have not been accepted in their families. But that's becoming less so. The trans thing is now the challenge we have. And they're all God's children. They have their own dignity and worth their own individuality, their own authenticity, and that's a beautiful thing for us to embrace. So They're all God's creation. So here's three phrases again for putting faith in the politics. You gotta know people, knowing people, uh, seeing a spark of the divine mm -hmm. in those people, and knowing they're all children of God. The LGBTQ are all initials that are beloved of God. So that's putting faith in the politics, okay? Um, a Maybe question. One, one moment. Right here, yes, yeah. front row. <laughs> um, hello, Madam Speaker. Hi. My name is Kira. I'm a graduate student in the School of Foreign Service, the Master of Science in Foreign Service program. And one thing that I've really struggled with in my pursuit of, um, of service to the country, to the world, is using faith to kind of focus in on a particular issue that really matters to me because there's so many valid things to focus on mm -hmm. and so many people in the world that need help, so many issues. And I'm wondering how your faith has helped you find a direction and a purpose because you said know your why, why, but if you have so many whys, so many things that you care about and pulling you in, and so many challenges in the world that seem very insurmountable. I'm curious how you use that guidance and that faith to really focus in on, on something because we can't influence, we can't change every single aspect, but how do you, 
how do you narrow your focus and really stay strong in that? I appreciate that. Yeah, well, if you know your why, when you weigh the equities about how you prioritize among all of those things, uh, because if you're talking about saving the planet, the planet is a health issue, it's a jobs issue, it's a security issue because drought and all the rest causes migration or competition for uh, resources or habitat, and it's a values issue. It's God's creation. If you believe, as I do, many of us do, that it is a God's creation, we have a moral responsibility to be good, moral, uh, good stewards of it. If you don't, you, we all agree, even if you don't ha aren't a person of faith, that we have a moral responsibility to future generations to pass it on responsibly. So some of the issues capture a, a lot of things, whether it's education, whether it's health care, whether it's environmental justice, whatever. It all comes back down to justice. But it, it, you're right, there's so many issues and if you're a member of Congress, you're dealing with one after another like this. I often look and see folks just focusing on one thing. I think, what a wonderful luxury. But on the other hand, yeah. what a luxury to go from one to the other. But you just, it's, you know, I keep saying to people, weigh the equities. What, as, as you, compete for priorities, and that's, prioritizing is very important. Because um, when we talk about this, and it takes me back to encouraging all of you to seek public service or help somebody do it or support a cause that you care about, it's about the vision. What is the vision that you have about whatever it is? And what do you know about it? You can't know everything, nobody does. And you wanna be current anyway, so what do you know? What do you, Vision, the knowledge, which gives you judgment. And judgment is what we want from elected officials. Not necessarily, well, this is what I've always believed. Now, in fact, new information has come along, but I'm stuck where I was in the past. No. Knowledge and judgment about making decisions. And then, again, as you're prioritizing, what can you strategically do? Vision. Knowledge, judgment, strategic thinking, how you get it done. The why, the what, the how. That's all up here in your head. But what people are interested in, most of all, is what's in your heart. Because all of this is something that you can learn or you can hire or whatever it is to help you communicate that. But what's in your heart is the authentic sincere, this is what I believe, and that's why I have prioritized this. It doesn't mean you don't bring that value system to other aspects of your, your, your you know, in the healthcare, we got China, I got, you know, we got a lot of things going on here, but they all come down to meeting the needs of, of people, yeah. meeting the needs of people. So it is, um, I think you should follow your passion. What is it the thing that you're most passionate about? Mm -hmm. Because it does have an emotional right. as well as an intellectual um, judgment involved in it. So just enjoy it, follow your passion, and it might take you a different place. But I'll tell you this one thing, be ready. I never thought I was ever gonna run for anything. Never, not even entertained it for a thousandth of a second. And then people came to me and said, Ron, you should run. You love the issues. And this will enable, because I was a volunteer in democratic politics, but you love the issues. You'll really like this. So they came to me to ask me to run. And um, I had four of the kids were in college already, but one was at 16. She was going to be, a, she was young for class, but she was going to be a senior in high school. So I went to Alexandra. I said, Alexandra, mommy has been asked to run for Congress. I love my life. Um, if it were one more year, it would be an easier decision when you would be in college. But um, any answer is good, not to run or not. But what it involved is I'd be gone like three nights a week in Washington, D.C. when we're in session, and we're not always in session. And so, so I'm going to have you make this decision as to whether I will mm -hmm. go or not. Any answer is OK to what she said. Now I'm saying mommy has a chance to write. Mother, 
you get the you get the change in our dynamic here. Mother, get a life. Now, <laughs> now this was 35 years ago, and I never heard that expression before. And so, <laughs> I, what teenage girl would not want her mother out of the house three nights a week? <laughs> Nothing about what I could contribute to the goodness. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, so I did. I mean, I had a life, and I have a, a different kind of a life. But um, but it was because of the children that that I thought I ha I can't mm -hmm. pass up an opportunity for the children. Throw a punch, take a punch. <laughs> and again, it's it's what drives you there. Now, at that time, our city was immersed in the AIDS epidemic. And so many of my friends that I had worked with and I've held in my arms, and they were like a bag of bones, it's this horrible thing that was happening. So when I went to the floor of the house, some people there said to me, when you are sworn in, I was a special election because our member passed away. When you're, introduced, when you're introduced, don't say a word. Nobody wants to hear from a new member of Congress. They don't even care what your name is, so don't say a word. And so um, the Speaker of the House, then Jim Wright, said, would the gentle lady from California wish to address that? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> so then these, all these people are like, short, be short, be real short, be real short. So. I got up and thanked my parents. My father had been in Congress, so he could be on the floor of the House. What a thrill. Oh, I had been in his arms when he was sworn in, and now he was in a wheelchair when I'm being uh, sworn in all these many years later, 3,000 miles away with a different name and a different district and all the rest. But I think the first daughter ever to follow a father, but not really follow, is 40 years later. But any of that, so I thanked my father, my constituents who sent me there, and I said, I told my constituents that when I came here, I would tell you that I came to fight against HIV and AIDS. Thank you very much. So I go down and I look at these people thinking, that was it. I took longer to tell you about it than what I said. <laughs> it was less than one minute, which is what we're assigned in the House, not the Senate. But the house. So um, uh, they're like, oh, oh. And as I said earlier, they said, why would you ever want that to be the first thing people know about you, that you were here to fight about HIV and AIDS, the first thing they know about you? And why did you say that? And I said, well, that's because that's why I came here. Mm -hmm. And as I say, they say, it's easy for you because you, you know, da, da, San Francisco is so tolerant. I said, don't use the word tolerant with me. That's a condescending word in certain respects. This isn't about tolerance. It's about respect. It's about taking pride, taking pride. So they always ask me, how can you raise a Catholic, blah, 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 be so much out there for uh, LGBTQ rights? I said, well, how could I not be? I mean, what, what's your problem? <laughs> it's your problem. It's not mine. It's my joy. So it is, again, and so you take every sling and arrow they send your way because you know why you, you are there. But again, follow your passion and know why you're there and the difference you want to make and how to strategize it and be informed, but tell them sincerely what is in your heart. Yeah. It's your problem, it's my joy. <laughs> so what you heard today is politics not as a career, but as a vocation. Your vocation has been clear and yours has always been about the children, always yeah, the about children. the children. Yeah. So, but well, uh, the Frank McCourt, he named it for his father, a yeah. uh, lovely man, and we're so grateful to him for the magnificent contribution that he made to Georgetown and the pride he takes in all of this, and how wonderful to have this manifestation of the McCourt family values. Well, uh, we could, I could sit here and have this conversation most of the day, and you all would probably stay, but we can't do it. She has other things to get back to. Uh, uh, so you, uh, you, you, your future is full of all kinds of things. One thing I hope will be an advisor to the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center on Faith and Justice. <laughs> but let us thank this wonderful uh, mm -hmm. political leader 
a wonderful person and this wonderful person of faith for this conversation we've had. One, she always says one more thing. Well, right? now I'm going to give you the last word, but I want to use one word that makes all the difference in all of this, and that is courage. Mm -hmm. I want you to have the confidence of the beautiful education you have received and the values that you bring to all of this and how you... Uh, uh, President DeJoya is a champion of the idea of we teach the children, we learn from the children. Right. They're our, you are our teachers as well. And, um, but the courage to do all of this is a really important thing. The courage I saw in Svetlana this morning to be fighting Lukashenko as a jerk who's the president of, I mean, Putin is an evil person. Lukashenko is an evil jerk. I mean, they're both, but anyway. But the courage to make the fight whatever it is, and the respect that you have for other people's opinion. That's a very legitimate thing since yeah. the beginning of our country. Our founders had this vision of this great country where people would be respected. They did not reflect all of that in our founding document, the Constitution, but they made it amendable so that we could mm -hmm. always expand freedom, whether it was black men having the right of abolition of slavery, black men having the right to vote, then finally women and LGBTQ in the court. But then when Dobbs came, that was a reversal of expanding freedom in our country. So what we always want to do, and this goes back to the first question, is to honor the vision of our founders, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform for the freedom we have to do what we do and the aspirations of our children as we listen to all of you as to what you want the future to be. But the courage, and that's what I salute my members for. None of what we have done would get gotten done without the courage of the members. So thank you, you for your courage. You have a quote here just from Mother Teresa that says, God doesn't expect us to be successful, but God does expect us to be faithful. It's on your desk to keep that in mind. So yeah. here is someone who's been very successful, but as you can hear today, it's because she's been faithful. Let's mm -hmm. give our great Thank thanks. You.